Welcome in, everybody. Today, we're going to be diving deep into something uh, you might not hear about every day when it comes to autism, and that is internalized ableism. Mm. And we've got a really interesting mix of stuff to help us unpack this. Articles, personal stories, even some insights directly from autistic individuals themselves. So by the end of this deep dive, you'll not only know what internalized ableism is, but also get a sense of its impact and how we can all challenge it. Yeah, and I think what's interesting is just how deeply these societal ideas mm. about what's normal or successful can impact people on the spectrum. You know, these narratives often miss the diverse ways that autistic people experience the world. And, you know, that can be really damaging. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the sources pointed out how internalized ableism can actually make it harder for someone to recognize their own strengths. It's almost like they've internalized this idea that they constantly have to prove their worth. Right. Which, I mean, that can be really damaging. It's true. And, you know, a good example of that is masking, um, you know, where autistic individuals might suppress their natural traits just to try and fit in. It's like they're constantly putting on a performance, which, as you can imagine, can be incredibly exhausting and even lead to burnout. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. this this idea of masking really hit me hard. Imagine having to constantly monitor your every move. Trying to fit into a world that doesn't really understand you. Yeah. You know, it's exhausting. It's unfair. There's a story actually in one of the articles about an autistic woman who spent years trying to hide her stimming behaviors because she was afraid of being judged. She felt like she constantly had to, like, you know, monitor her every move mm -hmm. and force herself to act, quote unquote, normal, even though it was totally draining. Yeah, it makes you think, like, what are we really teaching people about acceptance and self-love if they feel like they have to hide such a fundamental part of themselves, you know? It really highlights the insidious nature of ableism. It's heartbreaking for sure. And this internal pressure to conform, I mean, it can have real consequences. One of the sources highlighted the link between internalized ableism and higher rates of anxiety and oppression among autistic individuals. Yeah. And I mean, think about the impact this can have on an autistic person's journey of self-discovery and acceptance. You know, they might struggle to seek help or advocate for their needs just because they've internalized these negative messages. Boy, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? Society tells you you're different, then you start to believe it. And then that belief prevents you from seeking help or advocating for what you need. And that's where this conversation gets really interesting, right? It's not just about feeling good about yourself. It's about dismantling this whole system that tells autistic people that they're somehow lesser. For sure. And something I found really insightful was how some of the sources talked about the specific messages in society that really fuel this internalized ableism. Like, for instance, the emphasis on eye contact as a measure of social engagement. You know, for some autistic individuals, that can be really challenging and can make them feel inadequate in social situations. It's so true. It reminds me of that saying, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. We need to shift away from these narrow definitions of what's considered normal and start recognizing the value of neurodiversity. Yeah, definitely. And speaking of narrow definitions, another area where this internalized ableism can show up is in the language we use, like terms like high functioning or low functioning. Those are not only inaccurate, but they can be incredibly damaging. Oh, totally. I was actually just reading an article about how these labels can lead to misconceptions and assumptions about an individual's abilities. They completely disregard the fluctuating nature of autism. And the fact that a person's support needs can vary a lot depending on the environment or situation. Exactly. And, you know, often these labels are based on a medical model that views autism as something to be fixed. What we need is a shift towards a social model that recognizes that, you know, autistic people aren't broken. They're just different. And society needs to adapt to be more inclusive. That is such a powerful way to put it. It's not about changing autistic people. It's about changing the systems and attitudes that create barriers for them. Mm -hmm. And that starts with challenging our own biases and assumptions about what it means to be, quote unquote, normal. Yeah. And this is especially relevant when it comes to education. A lot of the sources talk about how traditional educational settings often don't accommodate the needs of autistic students, leading them to feel like they don't belong or that there's something wrong with them. You know, it's so interesting how this idea of belonging ties back into internalized ableism. If an autistic child is constantly being told explicitly or implicitly that they need to change who they are to fit in, I mean, it's no wonder they start to internalize those messages and doubt their own worth. Absolutely. We need to create environments that celebrate neurodiversity yeah. and provide the necessary support for all students to thrive, regardless of their learning style or communication preferences. For sure. And that brings up another really important point. 
the role of allies. One of the things that our sources highlighted was how crucial it is for non-autistic people to listen to, believe, and amplify autistic voices. Right. It's not about speaking for autistic people. It's about standing alongside them in solidarity and advocating for change. I love this standing in solidarity. It's about recognizing that we all have a responsibility to create a more just and inclusive world for everybody, regardless of neurotype. So I want to pause here for a second and ask you a question. Have you ever witnessed or maybe even experienced something that felt like internalized ableism? It could be a subtle comment, a look, or even an internal thought that reflects this bias that we're talking about. Just take a moment and reflect. It's important to remember that this doesn't exist in a vacuum. It intersects with other forms of oppression like racism, sexism, and homophobia, creating unique challenges for autistic individuals who hold those identities. Right. That's where the concept of intersectionality comes in, right? We can't talk about internalized ableism without recognizing the diverse experiences of autistic people from all walks of life. Exactly. And, for example, one of our sources highlights the specific pressures that autistic women face. They often have to navigate both neurotypical and gendered expectations. That's a really good point. Imagine that added layer of complexity, societal expectations for how women should behave clashing with an autistic woman's natural way of being. It's bound to lead to internal conflict. Absolutely. And there's this growing awareness about addressing the unique experiences of autistic people of color, you know, who might face extra barriers because of systemic racism. One of the articles we read shared a really powerful story about an autistic black man. He talked about this double burden of having to navigate both racism and ableism. And he spoke about how he often felt like he had to mask his autistic traits even more in predominantly white spaces mm. to avoid being perceived as a threat. It's a tough reminder of how these systems of oppression can really compound and create even bigger challenges for those at the intersection. It's heartbreaking. And it really highlights the need to create a world that's truly inclusive and equitable for all autistic individuals regardless of their background or their identity. You know, one of the things that gives me hope is the growing movement of autistic self-advocacy. More and more autistic individuals are speaking out challenging stereotypes and reclaiming their narratives. It's empowering to see, isn't it? It reminds me of that quote, nothing about us without us. You know, autistic people are the experts on their own experiences, and their voices need to be at the forefront of any efforts to create positive change. Absolutely. And this movement isn't just about changing individual attitudes. It's about dismantling the systemic barriers that prevent autistic people from fully participating in society. And one of the sources actually dives into some specific examples of these barriers, like the lack of accessible and inclusive workplaces. You know, many autistic individuals struggle to find jobs that accommodate their sensory needs and communication styles. It's a huge loss, not only for the individuals, but for society as a whole. Think about all the talent and innovation we're missing out on. Because we aren't creating environments where autistic people can thrive. It makes you think what could be possible if we truly embraced neurodiversity and saw it as a strength rather than a deficit. There are some encouraging signs, though. Some companies are starting to recognize the value of neurodiversity and they're implementing programs to recruit and support autistic employees. That's really great to hear. It's definitely a step in the right direction. But we need to see this kind of commitment to inclusion become the norm, not the exception. I agree, and it goes beyond just employment, too. We need to see this shift in thinking across all areas of society, from education to healthcare to social spaces. One of our sources talks about this concept of universal design which is basically the idea of creating environments and products that are accessible to people of all abilities right from the start. Yeah. It's not about making special accommodations. It's about designing a world that works for everyone. I love that concept. It shifts the focus from fixing individuals to creating a world that's inherently inclusive and welcoming. Right. It makes you wonder why we haven't been doing this all along. Exactly. It just makes sense. And it goes beyond physical accessibility, too. It's also about creating spaces where people feel safe, respected and valued for who they are. And that reminds me, we were talking about feeling safe and respected earlier. Remember that story about the autistic woman who's hiding her stimming behaviors? Yeah, it's a powerful reminder of the emotional toll that masking can take. It's this form of self-censorship that can lead to, you know, anxiety, depression, even a sense of being disconnected from yourself. And one of the sources uses a really powerful metaphor to describe masking. They say it's like wearing a suit of armor every day. You know, it might protect you from some external threats, but it weighs you down and prevents you from expressing who you are. That's such a powerful image, and it shows how much we need to create spaces where autistic people don't feel this pressure to mask. We need to foster this culture of acceptance and understanding. 
where autistic individuals feel safe to be themselves, to stim freely, and to express their unique ways of being without fear of judgment. And that goes back to challenging our own biases and assumptions about what we consider normal. We need to learn from autistic people, listen to their perspectives, and expand our understanding of what it means to be human. So as we head into the final part of our deep dive, I want to leave you with this question. What are some small but meaningful ways you can challenge internalized ableism in your own life? Maybe it's being more mindful of the language you use. Maybe it's educating yourself more about autistic experiences. Or maybe it's just being more aware of the subtle ways that ableism shows up in our society. Just take a moment to think about what actions you can take. We've talked a lot about internalized ableism, you know, how it shows up, its impact, and how we can challenge it. But I kind of want to shift gears for a bit and think about like what a future could look like where this is less of a burden for autistic people. What are your thoughts? Well, I think it's a future where autistic people are celebrated for their unique strengths and perspectives. You know, imagine a world where an autistic child doesn't grow up feeling like they have to mask who they are to fit in and where their differences are actually seen as valuable contributions to society. That's a beautiful thought. A world where differences aren't just tolerated, but they're embraced. But how do we get there from where we are now? Well, one of the sources talked about moving away from what they call the medical model of disability. This model tends to focus on fixing autism, which kind of contributes to this idea that there's something inherently wrong with autistic people that needs to be corrected. It's like we're trying to, you know, fit square pegs into round holes. Yeah. Instead of appreciating the unique shape of each individual right. Exactly. What we need is a shift to a social model where we recognize that the barriers faced by autistic people are often created by society, not by their autism itself. It's about changing the environment, not the person. So instead of trying to make autistic people more neurotypical, we should focus on creating a world that's more accessible and inclusive for everybody. Exactly. And that means things like designing sensory-friendly spaces, promoting inclusive education, and advocating for policies that support the full participation of autistic individuals in all aspects of society. You know, there was a quote from one of the sources that really stuck with me. It said, disability is not a problem to be solved, but rather a valuable part of human diversity. It challenges us to really rethink our whole approach to disability. Absolutely. And when we start to see disability as just part of the human experience, you know, we open up to a whole world of possibilities. We're expanding our definition of what it means to be human. And, you know, speaking of possibilities, one thing that gives me a lot of hope is this growing movement of autistic self-advocacy. Yeah, it's so powerful to see autistic people taking control of their own stories and demanding to be heard. They're not just objects of study or charity, you know, they're active agents of change. Yeah, one of the sources actually highlighted some of the work being done by autistic-led organizations, like the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. They're fighting for disability rights and challenging the systems that perpetuate ableism. These organizations are doing some amazing work, not only advocating for policy changes, but also creating spaces where autistic people can connect and support each other. It's about reclaiming power and creating that sense of community and belonging. And it's a good reminder that real change happens when we center the voices of those who are most affected by the issue. Definitely. And as allies, it's our responsibility to listen to and amplify those voices and use our privilege to support their fight for equality and justice. Absolutely. So as we wrap up this deep dive into autism and internalized ableism, I just want to leave you with one final thought. Imagine a world where every autistic person feels valued, empowered, and free to be their authentic selves. That's a world worth fighting for, and it's a world we can create together. Thanks for joining us on this journey of exploration. We hope you'll continue to learn, challenge your own biases, and be an active part of creating a more just and inclusive world for everyone.